Hi, everybody. It's Dana Stengel here with Taringa Ranch. And today is Tuesday, and it is time for our weekly kids program. What? Are you just finding about, out about that this week? Well, look back on the YouTube channel and you will find all sorts of other kids programs that we've been doing for the past three months. So you have a lot of catching up to do. Anyway, today we are doing something a little bit different. Um, we are doing a native California series. We're always talking about native wildlife, but for this series, we decided to include people that are native to the area, right? So, and of course, their relationship with wildlife. And one of my favorite things, mythology and folklore that go along with their stories. Like stories are so important. So last week, we talked about the Tongva. They are the LA area Native Americans, and they um, we learned a lot, super interesting stuff. We shared a folk tale. I was so interested in it that I went ahead and got another book. This is not for today. This is a preview for next time. Well, not next time. We have a calendar. But this is going on my next calendar. So probably like October. This is a Tongva uh, tale. It is a Tongva creation story. So that's not for today, but that is coming up. I am so excited about it. Let me just show you one of the pictures. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so we're going to set that aside for now. And we are here today because we are talking about the Miwok. Now, they come from a, di they're a different part of California. So if the Tongva lived in the LA area, the Miwok lived just east of San Francisco, sort of in the middle of California, uh, but further north. And um, Yosemite was one of the areas that they lived. So uh, first we're gonna share a little bit about them. And then we're gonna share uh, the book. And then we're gonna share a folktale. So, and, and all along we're gonna incorporate wildlife. So hold on, because here we go. All right. So they have a couple of different names here. You can see, I don't know if this, this might be um, mirrored. I'm not sure if it is or not, but uh, we're going with Miwok because that's been the standard use most recently, but they are also known as the Miwok, the Miwok or the Mewok all sounds a little different to different people, right? And um, they are from, I guess it's technically considered Northern California, but if you look at, at a map, which I will show you from Wikipedia, that is where in California you would find them in that gray area. And so if that's the Bay Area, they're just inland, okay? So um, they, there are different groups within the Miwok too. So I might be sharing, I don't even know, this, the book is gonna help us understand, but there are Miwok that come from the Plains and the Sierra and from the Sacramento Valley, from the San Joaquin Valley or from the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. So really depending on where they lived, that determined um, how they lived and what they ate and basically what their life was like. So we're gonna hear about that in a minute. And what else? Mm. 
They um, lived in small bands without centralized political authority. So they didn't have like a big government or anything. Um, and they apparently had dogs and they were hunter gatherers. So that's kind of interesting. Um, oh, so last time we talked about the California black oak a little bit. And sure enough, this time we learned that the Sierra Miwok harvested acorns from the California black oak. That was the one I was telling you, we were on a hike and we came across a tree and there were pods on the ground and my friend opened it up and her hands were black for three days because of all the tannins in the nut. That was really cool. Um, in fact, the modern day extent of the California black oak forests in some areas of Yosemite National Park is partially due to cultivation by Miwok tribes. So that is pretty amazing. So they would burn understory vegetation and reduce the fraction of ponderosa pine. They would eat uh, all kinds of vegetable matter, including bulbs, seeds, and mushrooms. They hunted animals with arrows, clubs, and they made traps that were snares, depending on the species and the situation. Oh, they loved grasshoppers. Talk about a great protein source. And mussels from the river. They were near the Stanislaus River in particular. And so there are often mussels and they like to eat those. Uh, the coastal Miwok were known to um, get food from, from that area. And so they would even get abalone from the Pacific Ocean. One thing that's kind of cool about the Miwok is they would eat when they were hungry, not at mealtimes. Can you imagine that? I would like to imagine that. And let's see. They associated with different uh, totem animals and they identified with one of two groups of people. Uh, either they were land people or they were water people. Kind of like us, right? Some of us are land people and some of us are water people. And their totem animals were not thought of as literally ancestors, but more like those are the ones that came before us. All right. So anything else interesting there? Mm, not really. Okay. So next stop today. Put this away is the book. So this book is kind of cool. It's part of a series. We're not doing all of them. We're doing, well, we did the Tongva. We're doing the Miwok. And next time we're going to be doing the Pomo. But look at all of the other ones that you could learn about. So this is a pretty great series. And I think that uh, you can't read that anyway, because I think that my YouTube is showing you a mirror. But we are going to just look at the pictures anyway. All right. Who are the Miwok? Here is a picture. And this, does this look like a modern day Miwok or an old, old school? That guy is probably from today, right? He's probably teaching people about the old ways. And what does it look like he's holding in his hand? Yeah, that's also what I think. Let's see. Okay, the name Miwok was first used by the Central Sierra Miwok to identify themselves. Scholars also apply the name to other native groups that speak the same language, although these people originally used many different names to identify themselves. The Miwok people can be divided into two large groups that span the state of California. The Coast Miwok and the Land Miwok lived in the western part of the state. The Bay, Plains, and Sierra Miwok lived in the east. When the Europeans arrived 
During the 16th century, there were more than 20,000 Miwok living in the California region. The Europeans thought the Miwok were primitive people. Today, we recognize that the Miwok way of life could be beautiful and practical. The Miwok people's abilities allowed them to prosper for thousands of years. The Miwok culture continues to change with the Miwok people's modern descendants. This picture shows Phil Johnson, a Miwok man, talking about traditional Miwok culture at the Yosemite Museum in 2014. Pretty cool. All right. Living off the land. So we're going to show you this picture, right? Probably the way it must have looked way back when. And then this picture, this is today, right? The places where the various Miwok groups lived provided the different kinds of resources they used to survive. The coast, lake, bay, plains, and Sierra Miwok developed different lifestyles based on what was available to them. The coast Miwok lived in the areas that are now Marin and Southern Sonoma counties. The Lake Miwok lived along the shores of Clear Lake and the Bay Miwok lived on the Eastern part of San Francisco Bay. The Plains and Sierra Miwok lived inland and depended on land resources. Nearly all of the Miwok's lands were filled with elk, deer, and bear. Those who lived near the coast also hunted sea otters, seals, and sea lions. The lakes, rivers, and streams offered fish and shellfish. The Miwok gathered many kinds of plants to make food and tools. They also ate acorns, mushrooms, and berries. Oh, sounds like we just heard that somewhere. Hmm. How they cooked. All right, this is kind of cool. Look at that picture. What could that picture have to do with how they cooked? Hmm. The Miwok used a number of tools and methods to prepare food. Nuts were crushed and ground using stone tools, including flat slabs called matates and rocks with round holes called mortars. The ground nuts were sometimes used as flour. Cooking pits were used to roast food. These pits were made by digging a hole in the ground and building a fire in the hole. After the fire died, the wood would be removed from the hole. Food wrapped in bundles was then placed in the hole to be heated by the hot rocks and soil. That sounds like a great way to conserve energy. I like it a lot. I bet it was delicious. Many dishes were prepared like modern stews. The Miwok used watertight baskets instead of pottery bowls. Stones heated in the fire were stirred into the mixture inside the basket. A large wooden paddle was used to keep the hot stones moving. Can you imagine heating your soup or stew from the inside with hot rocks that you would stir around? That sounds awesome. Oh my goodness. This photo shows the holes in which the Miwok ground acorns and other nuts. I love learning about other cultures. Where they lived. Miwok houses were usually built with a circular floor plan. Wooden poles were used as a framework for walls built of reeds, reed mats, and grass. At the center of every home was a fire pit used to cook family meals and heat the house. A hole in the center of the roof allowed smoke to escape and let light in. Some houses were covered with clay to keep them warm and dry during bad weather. 
The door to each house was covered with a reed mat or animal hide. Miwok communities had populations of 20 to 200 people. There were two kinds of Miwok communities, hamlets and villages. Hamlets were small settlements where people who were related to each other lived. Villages were larger communities where a headman or leader and his family lived. And here you can get a real close up picture of the inside of a Miwok home. And you can see the hole in the roof where the smoke can come out and the spot on the ground there where they put the fire to keep warm. Oh, these temporary Miwok shelters are made from, can you tell? It's tree bark. How resourceful. The Headman's Village had a larger structure that served as an assembly hall. These buildings are sometimes called roundhouses. Some measured more than 60 feet wide and had clay floors that were five feet deep. Four massive upright logs supported the smaller beams that made up the cone-shaped roof. Most settlements also had a sweat lodge with a large fire in the middle. This fire filled the building with smoke and high heat. Sweat lodges were used for healing and religious ceremonies. I have a picture of a sweat lodge I want to show you. That is a picture of a sweat lodge. And if you look in there, you can even see the feet of a person sitting in there. So it's small, but it's really going to contain that heat. And they are going to use that for religious ceremonies. And here is an also a super cool picture. Remember I showed you guys the village picture of the Tongvan by the LA River? Well, this one I think is sort of its parallel picture. These are the Miwok living in the shadow of the mountain among the trees with dogs, right? So I thought that was kind of a cool picture too. I wanted to share that with you. All right. Um, the Miwok also built storehouses or granaries on wooden platforms or in tree trunks. These were used to preserve food. Many of the Miwok moved to temporary camps several times each year to take advantage of changing food resources. They built structures there out of grasses, leaves, bark, and reeds. So I guess this is a temporary camp, right? Do you ever do a temporary camp? Have you gone camping? Seems to me that's kind of like what they're doing, isn't it? All right. Oh, yes. Look who's here. You know that guy. Yes, you do. Coyotes were featured in many stories told by the Miwok. And they're honored for their cleverness. Do we honor Coyote for his cleverness? I don't think we do. Social structure. All right. Talk about social structure in Miwok land. The smallest Miwok social unit was the family. Each family belonged to one of two larger units called moieties. Each moiety, I know it's a crazy word, moiety but it's an important word. And do I have a picture? I do, ha <laughs> I do. Moiety, I didn't, I, I don't use this word that often, let's just say. Okay, so that's a group, family group, lineage, family group, lineage. Remember we were talking about the land people and the sea people? Well, for our purposes here, one of these is the land people, and one of these is the sea people. All right. Oh, 
So, each moiety was represented by a common animal ancestor, such as a wildcat or a coyote. A reference to a person's moiety was usually included in his or her name. No one was allowed to marry anyone from their own moiety. Two moieties made up the largest Miwok social unit, which is known as a triblet. The most powerful Miwok leaders had assistants that helped them communicate and organize community events. Each Miwok headman was helped by a female religious leader, sometimes called a dreamer or head woman. Villages also had people who served as doctors. Doctors gathered sacred objects they believed held special powers. They were respected and feared by other members of the community who believed they could use their powers to harm people. Government. All right, here we go. Look at that picture right there. That looks like it's probably, yeah, it's that roundhouse we were talking about where the elder has his meetings. You see how that's different from the other houses we've looked at so far? It's even a little bit underground. It's kind of cool. The tribalit was the basic unit of Miwok government. The population of most tribalits ranged from 100 to 500 people. A tribalit's territory included food gathering and hunting areas, the main village, and related hamlets. The position of that headman was passed down from a father to his son. The headman managed important parts of daily life in the community. He was responsible for paying for major celebrations and hosting visitors. Anyone who wanted to use the tribalit's resources had to ask the headman for permission. He sometimes acted as a judge for family conflicts. Some headmen had a staff of special hunters, fishermen, cooks, and servers. These people helped during religious ceremonies or when outsiders were visiting. The Miwok also had speakers who were people who took orders directly from the headman and often ruled over smaller hamlets. Sounds pretty involved and interesting. Warfare. The village headman usually led his warriors in battle. Okay, but just so you know, as we look at this, this guy's fishing. He's not battling anything. That's kind of a cool picture. I feel like that's a reenactment, I don't know. I don't know. No, it isn't. Ha! Huh. 1924. This picture was taken in 1924. That's awesome. The village headman usually led his warriors in battle. The Miwok protected their land against challenges from other American Indian communities and sometimes launched attacks to gain property and captives. Sometimes wars were started when one community accused another of using magic to cause problems with the environment, such as floods. The Miwok used spears and bows and arrows in combat. Can you imagine being blamed for a flood? Yikes. Between 1769 and 1880, the Europeans introduced horses to the American Indians. The Miwok tamed horses and learned how to use them as a resource. Riding horses changed the methods used in Miwok warfare. The Europeans also introduced guns, which made warfare deadlier than ever before. With the weapons introduced by the Europeans, Conflicts between American Indian communities and clashes with Europeans resulted in greater violence than had existed before. Okay. And up oh, almost. Religion. The Miwok religion aimed to help people understand the world and their place in it. 
focusing on the need to keep the balance between humans and the natural environment. Many hours were spent gathered in roundhouses for community worship. Young people learned about traditions and history from Miwok elders. They held religious celebrations on many occasions, including acorn harvests, births, and marriages. During the ceremonies, the Miwok generally sang and danced. Religious leaders wore special body paint and colored feather headbands. Music was made using wooden clapper sticks, hollow foot drums, flutes, and whistles. And here is a picture of a wooden clapper stick. Kind of cool, huh? The modern Miwok preserve hundreds of traditional religious stories. Mount Diablo in Western California is still regarded as a sacred place. According to many elders, Grandfather Coyote created the Miwok people, along with everything they needed to survive at this mountain peak. And this photo, which was taken in 1872, shows a group of Miwok people gathered for a religious celebration in the Yosemite Valley. This is kind of a cool photo. Arts and crafts. Some Miwok art may have been inspired by their religious beliefs. The Eastern Miwok marked rocky outcroppings with intricate designs, such as human tracks, wheels, circles, and similar geometric patterns. These images were lightly carved into the rocks. These types of markings are called petroglyphs. They are sacred to many American Indians. The Miwok made things that were both practical and beautiful. Miwok women were incredible basket makers. They collected special grasses and tree shoots to weave together into different patterns and decorated the baskets using feathers and shells. Bones were transformed into combs, hairpins, beads, and needles. Hemp was used to make thread to weave into bags, belts, and nets. Miwok villagers often traded with their neighbors. They often paid their trading partners in shell beads that served as a kind of money. This Miwok woman is shown holding a sifting basket. Baskets made by the Miwok were highly prized in trade. And so you can see that one is not that tightly woven because she's going to use it to, sh to sift something, probably flour made from maybe those ground nuts, right? All right. Dealing with the newcomers. Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo was the first European to explore the Pacific shoreline of California. In 1542, some of the coast Miwok saw Cabrillo's ships. He told the American Indians that he was claiming the region for King Carlos I of Spain and that it was now a part of the new Spain. During the, hundred years, during the 200 years that followed, many other Europeans explored the region. Among them was an Englishman named Sir Francis Drake. He stopped in the Miwok region to repair his ship before continuing his voyage around the world. Drake's expedition provided the first illustrations and descriptions of the Miwok. Although the Europeans didn't start a colony in California until 1769, they brought about many changes before that time. They introduced illnesses such as smallpox, which killed tens of thousands of American Indians. And here is a monument to Juan Cabrillo. And that one is in San Diego, apparently. So, the Spanish and Russian empires. All right, we're getting to the end. I am really excited to tell my folk tale. In 1776, a military base and mission were established in what's now San Francisco. A Spanish naval officer, Joseph Canizares, 
followed the shoreline into the lands of the Bay Miwok. Most of the foreigners' activities took place in a narrow strip of coastal land that stretched from San Diego to San Francisco. Here they built a chain of military colonies called presidios and towns called pueblos. They also built missions, which were used to spread Christianity and the Spanish way of life. After 1794, large numbers of Coast Miwok, Bay Miwok, and Plains Miwok were drawn into the missions on the shores of San Francisco Bay because their traditional way of life was becoming increasingly difficult to maintain. In 1812, the Russians established a fort at Bodega Bay. As time passed, the invaders forced many Miwok to work for them as slaves. And these are, these are pictures of um, the Franciscan monks who were the ones that were coming from Spain to colonize. Okay, a changing world. Oh, look, it's this picture again, right? I love that picture, I think it's awesome. As Europeans entered California, they brought about changes that made it difficult to continue the traditional Miwok way of life. In 1821, more changes arrived when Mexico claimed control of California. Some Miwok resisted the further invasion of their lands. Violent conflicts led to many deaths. Many lives were also claimed by more disease in 1833. In 1847, Mexico ceded control of California to the United States, making conditions for the Miwok worse than ever. The United States government adopted policies that aimed to remove all American Indian people from California. The discovery of gold in California in 1848 caused an influx of settlers that displaced the Miwok from their homes. Many were forced to work as slaves. Today, the Miwok lands have been transformed by more than 200 years of the invaders' activities. In this picture, the caption says, conflict between gold miners and the Miwok resulted in the Mariposa Indian War of 1851. The U.S. Army defeated the Miwok in this war, forcing them out of the Yosemite Valley. The Miwok were given permission to return to the Yosemite Valley in 1855. Can you imagine being told you had to leave your home? The Miwok today. Treatment of the Miwok was slow to improve. The United States government set aside a few small areas called rancherias for the coast plains, Northern Sierra and Central Sierra Miwok. In 1924, the United States granted citizenship to all American Indians, partly in recognition for their bravery and sacrifices during World War I. The Miwok renewed their struggle to reclaim their homelands and educate their children. The Miwok are a proud nation anxious to preserve their heritage. Many Miwok people have been at the forefront of the environmental movement throughout their homelands. Some are working hard to correct incorrect portrayals of American Indians in television, movies, and classrooms. The Miwok continue to fight for the rights they deserve to build a better future for their people. Well done. And the author of this one, Jens Hawkinson. Well done. Thank you for that. Okay, and then last but not least, I have a super cool story to share with you. And you're going to have to decide, could this really happen? Spoiler alert. Okay, I'm not going to do a spoiler alert. Okay, no pictures here. This is just, uh, you know, a little pin out. It's not that long. This is one of their famous stories. Um, and this one is called The Birth of Falcon. And a falcon... It's a bird of prey, right? And we start this story with Condor. You guys know who Condor is, right? He's like giant wingspan, 
endangered list, back from the brink, friends of the California condor. We could go all day, but we won't. Condor always roosted on a certain large rock on a small hill between the west bank of the San Joaquin River and the eastern foot of Mount Diablo. He flew about hunting, but always returned every night to roost on the rock. <clears throat> After a time, the rock became ill and Condor brought two doctors to cure her. The doctors at once began to gather wood. It took them a whole day to bring enough for their purpose. That night, they built a big fire and placed the rock in its center. Then they piled on still more wood. When the rock became very hot, it suddenly burst with a loud report and from it came Falcon. As he emerged, he gave his characteristic cry. He flew to a tree and alighted upon a branch. The doctors then told Condor that his wife was well and had given birth to a boy. Falcon straight away became chief. He noticed that whenever he flew about, all the rocks called after him. Ooh. One day Falcon asked his father, why is it that all the rocks shout at me whenever I go out? Oh, said Condor, those are your relatives. They are rejoicing that you are chief. The next day, as Falcon flew near the river, he heard the same shouting and decided to sit on a stump and watch. Presently, he saw an object moving up and down the river and making a large ripple. He went to his father and inquired about this strange thing. Condor said, my son, that is your grandfather, the biggest and wisest man in the world. Well, said Falcon, I wish I might get him out of the water where I could talk to him and learn something. Condor replied, that you could never do. You might catch him and cut a small piece from his body that would then come to life and talk to you. Next day, the boy took his stone knife and sat down to watch for his grandfather. Finally, he cut off a piece of the stump upon which he was sitting, brought it home, and left it in the house. The next morning, Coyote appeared and walked around the house. Condor then said, Now, my son, you have your grandfather and he can instruct you in many things. I myself know very little. Of course, I will help you as much as possible, but Coyote can tell you all you wish to know. Coyote agreed to help Falcon make anything he desired. Falcon then went everywhere, and Coyote answered all his questions about things he had seen. Among other matters, Coyote told Falcon of the great Keylock. That is another story for another day. But what's cool about these stories is they have these characters that keep showing back up in the same role, but there's different stories about them. So this is just one story of Coyote, and this was uh, basically the birth of Falcon. So kind of interesting and cool and a different way to maybe think about native wildlife, right? All right, I think that is it. I think that is all I wanted to talk about, except I did also want to let you know that usually, so we're always meeting here on Fridays or Tuesdays, and next Tuesday, we will be back again with our final installment in the Native California series, which is the, the POMO. We're going to learn about the POMO. Um, and But in between then, I always do an adult program, or not really adult, but general audience, on Thursdays at 6. And this week, this Thursday in two days at 6, we're going to be doing a special program 
I'm wondering if you could guess what it's about. Oh, we got sloppy here. Does this guy tell you anything? Yeah. Ah. So yes, on Thursday, it's not a kid's program, but at 6 p.m., we are doing a program about bats in Southern California. So if you want to learn more about bats, feel free to join in. We would love to see you there. Otherwise, we will see you next week at four o'clock here on YouTube. And I hope that you have a fabulous weekend and a great week. Thank you for joining us today.